Good morning. Welcome to my living room and my dining room and to our first experiment with online worship. I hope that you have your printed out copy of the liturgy that will help you follow along, especially as we sing together. Let's begin with the call to worship. Our eyes have been focused on a lot in the past week, mostly on the news, I think. Let us now fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. Let us consider him who endured such opposition from sinful people, so that we will not grow weary and lose heart. As we fix our eyes on Jesus, let's sing together, He is Lord, which is on number 227, if you have the red hymnal in your house. caring God, we gather this day drained by another week. We are like a parched desert, empty and in need of replenishment. Visit us with your presence. Saturate us with your spirit and bathe us in your streams of living water that our lives might acknowledge and worship you to the praise and honor of Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus said, Come to me, all you that are weary, all who are carrying heavy burdens. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Oh God, we make so many mistakes. 
We turn away from you so often. We need you so much. Thank you that you so loved the world that you sent Jesus to die on the cross to save us from our sins. Amen. And that is our assurance of pardon, that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. And so our song of assurance is Jesus loves me, this I know. to look at a passage from Matthew, let us pray for the Spirit's illumination. Lord God, we wish to see Jesus. By your Spirit's power, give us eyes to see his glory. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Our scripture is from Matthew chapter 8, not technically in our reading for this past week, but still from the book of Matthew, beginning at verse 23. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. A windstorm arose on the sea, so great that the boat was being swamped by the waves, but he was asleep. And they went and woke him up, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, you of little faith? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a dead calm. They were amazed, saying, What sort of man is this? that even the winds and the sea obey him. This is the word of the Lord. Jesus' disciples were fishermen. They were quite familiar with the Sea of Galilee and its unpredictable weather patterns. They knew 
what to do in a storm. But something about this storm took them by surprise and made them realize that they could not save themselves this time. They were soaked. They were rocking and tipping and slipping and sliding. They were not in control. They were indeed perishing. Without some kind of intervention, they would most likely die and they were terrified. <laughs> Even though God was right there in the boat with them. Suddenly we know what that feels like to be at the mercy of a, a natural force that is out of our control, to know that we cannot stop it, at least you and I can't. We, we might put a lot of hope and, and faith in the multitude of scientists who are working round the clock to come up with a vaccine and, and a treatment, but, but you and I, garden variety Canadians, we can't really do anything except do nothing. Stay in our houses, keep to ourselves. We are, for the time being, at least helpless in the face of a teeny tiny virus more frightening than a storm at sea. For the past few weeks, it has been scarier to be on a luxury cruise ship than on that first century rickety boat tossed by wind and waves. If we have not already cried out, Lord, save us, we are perishing, we probably will in the days and weeks to come. Because it certainly looks as though this storm is going to get a lot worse before it gets better. Even though Jesus is right here with us. Is he asleep? Taking a bit of a snooze? Must we call out louder to get his attention? You know, Mark is usually shorter in his storytelling than Matthew's, but, but Mark, when Mark tells this story, he includes the curious little detail that Jesus is asleep in the stern on a cushion which sounds pretty comfy, doesn't it? But comfortably asleep in a storm so bad that it is terrifying experienced fishermen? How could he sleep? And is he asleep now? Is that our fear? Or, or is it that God's not paying attention? Or maybe worse, are we afraid that God is behind this? That God sent this virus? <clears throat> in a book called Letter to a Man in a Fire, the cancer survivor Reynolds Price responds to a letter from a young medical student who has developed a life-threatening cancer. In his letter to Price, this young student writes, I want to believe in a God who cares because I may meet him sooner than I had expected. I think I am at the point where I can accept the existence of God, but I can't yet believe God cares about me. Maybe he names the greatest fear of all. That God exists, but he doesn't really care about any of us. That seems to be the fear of the disciples that night on the boat. And it is a reasonable fear, is it not? Because Jesus is right there, but he's not doing anything except snoring, maybe. Our fears today are reasonable, too. Because just like no humans are yet immune to the coronavirus, we are not immune to pain and to evil just because we follow Jesus. We have reason to be afraid. So let's think about fear for a minute. I kind of 
want to stop here and ask you to talk among yourselves about what you might be afraid of, but I know some of you are by yourselves, and if I took a break like that, I would just sit here awkwardly wondering when you were finished, and that would be weird for all of us. So maybe you can talk about some of these things after the video is finished, or, or you could pause it for a while, but I'm just going to go on talking about fear. Fear is not a bad thing. That's the first thing I want to say. If you're afraid, that's okay. Don't feel guilty about that. Being afraid does not mean that your faith is weak. Fear is normal and it is a healthy response to danger. Fear keeps us from doing stupid things. And maybe fear is what's keeping you inside of your house right now, which is where you belong. So let fear do its work. Let it alert you to danger. Let it make you wash your hands and keep your distance. Let it help you protect your family. But don't feed your fear. Feed your faith instead. Instead of consuming every moment of news, know your limits. Don't bury your head in the sand, but consume things that feed your faith. That, that might be music or prayer or silent meditation, walks outside, a scripture. Now more than ever, be intentional about feeding your faith. Now that's probably not what these dripping wet disciples thought they needed on that cold, dark night. And of course, it was important that their fear led them to do everything they knew how to do to keep that little boat from tossing them into the Sea of Galilee. But none of their her hectic and heroic efforts were able to calm their greatest fears. That maybe they were wrong about Jesus. Maybe they were wrong about God wrong in so many ways. Maybe God really does just watch from a distance. Those were rational fears for them to have at that moment. So it seems just a tiny bit unfair for Jesus to jump all over them for their lack of faith, doesn't it? Especially since they did have enough faith to turn to Jesus for help, right? Matthew doesn't even include the line where the disciples ask if Jesus cares. We know that from the other Gospels. In Matthew, the disciples just beg Jesus to wake up and save them. And he does. Jesus rose. In this case, he only rose from the stern of a boat. But the word and the idea is actually the same. He rose from unconscious sleep, and he saved them, calming the chaos. Now, any Jew who knew anything about God knew that this showed some kind of connection between Jesus and Yahweh, who created the universe, the creator, the chaos tamer, was among them. This sets Jesus apart. The disciples put it well. <laughs> what kind of man is this? The disciples knew Jesus well enough to turn to him for help, but they're only now beginning to understand that he is even more than they thought. On the brink of, on the brink of destruction, God in Jesus Christ felt that same water, and he sensed the violent tossing of that boat. He was not distant from the disciples. He was right in their predicament. He was fully incarnate, fully human. Of course, that part they already knew. What they were about to learn is that he was also fully God. 
And as God, he spoke three little words that silenced the storm and rescued them all from almost certain death. And to any with the eyes to see and the ears to hear, it was obvious that the long-awaited messianic age had come. And it had come with more power and authority than anyone expected. So, yeah, wasn't it kind of unfair for Jesus to criticize those disciples for their lack of faith? Or was he criticizing Nadia Boltz Weber suggests that maybe when Jesus asked, where is your faith? He said it not as an accusation, but an invitation. Not a rhetorical question, but an invitation to reflect on where God is in the midst of storms. Maybe he was inviting the disciples to reflect on what it means to, to be alive on the other side of a situation that they thought would kill them. For us, that situation could be a divorce, an illness, the death of a parent or even a child, the loss of a job, depression, or a virus. Maybe if we survive the situation, we are being encouraged to ask those questions. Where was my faith? Where was God? What did I really fear? It's probably too early to ask or answer those questions now about our own faith. I think we're going to learn a lot about our own faith in the weeks and months to come. I pray for the day when we look back at March 2020 and say, oh yeah, Jesus was there. Didn't always see him. But he was there. And he was awake. And he cared. He never left us. In the Gospel of John, we find Jesus in Cana making wine at a wedding, but then just a few chapters later, we find him in Bethany crying tears at a funeral. So where was Jesus? At the wedding and at the funeral. Scripture tells us that if you've seen Jesus, you've seen God. So where is God? at the wedding and at the funeral. He is the God of the spectacular and the God of the ordinary. He is the God of the hills and the God of the valleys. He is God when the market is up and God when the market is down. He is God in the light and God in the dark. And he is with us in all of those, in all times, in all places. He is our ever-present help in time of trouble. A storm is raging. Our little boats are feeling pretty flimsy in the face of what is going on around us. So let us, as disciples of Jesus Christ, call out to God for help. And may we also do our part, keeping our distance, washing our hands, but also helping each other, sacrificing for each other. May we spread peace and trust and love in this frightened world by, by doing good loving our neighbors and proclaiming in word and in deed that no matter what happens, this is our Father's world and he is 
the ruler yet. Amen. No surprise that in response, I invite us to sing, This is My Father's World, page number 21. service, so I'm going to do something a little bit different for prayer, um, especially because I know a lot of you are, are with your families and with your children. I'm going to follow um, something called Prayers Especially for Children in the, in the worship source book and give you some time to, to pray amongst yourselves, silently or out loud. Um, this is a model that uses your hand to teach children how to pray. Um, we're going to begin with the, with the thumb. We begin here because the thumb is the closest to you. It reminds us to pray for those who are closest to us, such as our mother, father, brothers, sisters, and grandparents. I invite you now to pray for those closest to you. Amen. Now we're going to add the index finger, the pointer finger. Reminds us of people who point the way for us. People like parents and teachers, pastors, policemen, bus drivers, crossing guards, and so on. Pray for those in your life 
who point the way. Amen. The middle finger is the biggest of all. It reminds us to pray for people with big responsibilities. People like our prime minister, um, all the government leaders. Right now, the, the doctors, the nurses, the scientists who are all on the front lines trying to find a cure and a treatment. Uh, trying to make important decisions. Let's pray for them. Amen. The fourth is the weakest of our fingers. It reminds us to pray for people who are weak, such as those who are sick, already sick, uh, those who are sad and alone, those who are in hospitals and rest homes, those who are poor and starving and forgotten, those who are homeless in our own city, those who are particularly vulnerable to the coronavirus. Let us pray for those. Amen. Last is our pinky, our little finger. The Bible tells us we should think of other people before ourselves, but it's okay to pray for ourselves too, especially now if we are afraid, if we are sick. Um, let's take this last few moments and to pray for our own needs. Amen. Again, in an ordinary service, this would be the time that we take the offering. And that is something we haven't quite figured out how to do yet, although I know that uh, stewardship is working on it. I would like to remind you that the, uh, the bills continue to come in which is hard for me to say because I know a chunk of that is my salary, but there are other bills, there are other expenses, there are other causes, and, and our cause for the offering this week is the Woodland Christian High School Tuition Assistance Fund. If you can find a way to send them a check on your own, drop a check off at church, mail a check to 
to the deacons at church. Um, they will make sure that the money goes to those causes that, that we have promised to support. Let's see one more song uh, to close our time together apart. Um, Alleluia, number 958. to the day that I can bless you in person. But for now, may the Lord bless you, go before you to guide you, behind you to protect you, beneath you to support you, beside you to befriend you. May the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit surround you each one of you. Be not afraid. Go in peace. <laughs>